Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Leading Issues, CMI's broadcast that explores leading management issues with today's thinkers. I'm absolutely delighted today to welcome uh, David Smith. David is the economics editor of the Sunday Times. He's also chief leader writer, assistant editor, and policy advisor. He's authored several books, including Free Lunch, Easily Digestible Economics, and Something Will Turn Up, Britain's Economy's Past, Present, and Future. He's a visiting professor at Cardiff and Nottingham and has, and has won several awards. David, delighted to have you here with us today. And it's great to be joining you and to be talking to your guests. It's, uh, it's a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Well, today we're going to be exploring uh, a topic that I know uh, we're both keenly interested in, uh, which is productivity. And in specifically, um, as we go through the uh, broadcast, the role of management and leadership, perhaps. Um, but let me start off with the big picture. Why does the UK have such low productivity? Even before the financial crisis, labor productivity was on average 13% higher in the rest of the G7 countries. And of course, there's a big gap between regions with London productivity over 30% above the UK average um, and uh, uh, very low productivity levels in places like Wales and Yorkshire. So why do you think that is? I think you've summed it up very well there, Anne, but uh, I've, I've got some slightly up, more up-to-date figures. That the, the latest figures are that uh, the G7 average is 16% higher than, um, than the UK. France is 17% higher, and people are always puzzled by that um, because they, um, they think the French have a, uh, let's say, a more relaxed lifestyle than we do. And uh, America, uh, uh, productivity in America measured by output per worker is 49% higher than the UK. It's not every G7 country. Um, Japan has for a long time had lower productivity mm -hmm. than the UK, which surprises people. But the explanation for that is that um, uh, Japan has very efficient export industries, particularly manufacturing, but a, a long tail of um, low productivity services and agriculture, which drags the average down. But um, but why is it? I think the um, the reasons for low UK productivity are fairly simply stated that the um, the first big reason is that we invest less than the than other countries so business investment in the uk over quite a long period averages about 10 percent of gdp 10 percent of our national income mm -hmm. compared with a 14 percent average for the other countries that we compete with and if you take the the, the office for national statistics did an exercise recently where it looked at public and private investment together over the 30 years to just after the financial crisis to, to, and just after the Brexit vote to 2017. And of, of around about 35, 36 OECD countries, the UK was at the very bottom of that in terms of public and private investment together. So we don't invest enough, and that's the first problem. Mm -hmm. And the second one, I think, is skills. We do quite well in terms of tertiary level skills, top level skills, but basic skills, intermediate skills, the UK is very bad at. And part of the reason for that is that we um, we spend a lot less on on training than, than most other countries. And the the um, uh, Rishi Sunak, the uh, prime minister, when he was when he was chancellor, highlighted this in a in a speech, mm -hmm. which, which showed that um, the UK businesses spend only 50 percent of what their European counterparts do on quality in work training and quality in work training means getting training providers in to do uh, to do training we we i think t tend to have a sort of more informal attitude towards training in the uk skills as a consequence are tend to be lower investment is lower and that's why productivity is lower in the uk than most of our competitors yeah uh, well you've touched on a lot there uh, one of the main reasons you said is lower investment in training and a less uh, a more relaxed or less formal attitude towards high quality training um, certainly we find that uh, management and leadership being a prime example uh, we find that 71 percent of organizations don't train their managers at all um, uh, let alone you know with high quality training um, do you think that that's one reason British firms uh, tend to be more poorly managed than some of these other higher productivity countries. And what do you think we can do to improve? 
I think uh, I think it is it is a significant factor. I mean, I don't think the um, you know the analogy of the of Premier League football is necessarily the the most appropriate here. But if you look at um, the Premier League, you know, two thirds of uh, managers there come from outside the UK, and and the the proportion of um, UK managers at the moment is is higher than it usually is. So most of the quality football managers come from the rest of Europe. I think other countries have long had a more um uh, you know a more thought out rational formal process to management training than we have in the uk mm -hmm. i think we are we've gone for you know people who become senior managers in the uh, in the uk tend to have risen through the ranks and still stick you know you know most FTSE chief executives are accountants by training uh mm -hmm. the, the british ones rather than managers by training mm -hmm. and i think it shows you know i think it shows probably in maybe a penny pinching attitude towards investment which is the you know the fact one of the factors i was just talking about and maybe the same when it comes to training of the the rest of the workforce that they you know they kind of think they can get away with with not spending as much and and so i i think uh, and I don't want to tread on your toes here because you're, you know, you're, you're the experts in the in the fields of management training. But I think there is an issue there, and I think just as skills in the workforce more generally need to be need to be upgraded and uh, and better training offered, I think that also applies to managers in the UK. So it's it, you've said some things there, David, that you're not treading on our toes at all. I'm delighted to hear you say because I've often said that one of the issues is we have too many accountants leading FTSE 100 companies. <laughs> and, and I think that does, in fact, lead to a perhaps a discounting of the value of um, of, of being a good manager and leader as opposed to being technically competent and financially literate. Um, do you think that uh, maybe that is one of the reasons that other countries such as the US and Germany are better at investing in their management practices because they tend to be more managerial? I think it is. And I think also that there is a, um, there's a sense in which um, managers can only operate in the, um, in the environment in which they are they are placed, and I think uh, often sort of custom and practices develop within organisations, which have you know which it, it's quite difficult for someone who comes in to say, well, none of our managers are properly trained. We need to do this now because the 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 emphasis is always going to be on the day to day. How do we get through this problem? How do we get that through that problem? And I think too often training including management training is regarded as an add-on a luxury which doesn't have to be done now it can be can be done later and also i think there is part of the environment certainly quoted companies have to operate in is is the is the environment of who invests in them how short term are those investment horizons do you have to is it all about what happens in the next quarter or as i think is the case for many european firms and many american firms What's important is what happens over the next five to ten years, and I think we, we you know, short-term attitudes from investors translate quite easily into short-term attitudes among managers, and I think that is that is damaging too to our, our long-term prospects, to our productivity, to our performance, to our competitiveness, all all those things. Yes, and um, well, you mentioned also um, the shorter time horizons, and of course. Um, um, one of the things that strikes me is that when firms invest in capital um, and equipment, they don't expect an immediate return. Um, doesn't the same strike you if you're investing in management training, that if you're going to be investing in people, you can't expect an immediate return? And then therefore, perhaps some more incentives to do that might encourage firms? Or do you think that that wouldn't work? I think that should be the case. And in a rational world, that would be the case. I think you know you, we we talked and you, you talked about the um, the perhaps the accountancy bias within senior management and I think that is is a very powerful factor uh, but and it also translates into as I say the way that what the, what the expectations of investors are now over the years you know governments have tried to introduce policies which have encouraged more retention of profits more reinvestment and reinvestment not just in plant and equipment, but in training, in management training, all those things. But in the end, the pressure from investors is to is for dividends and to, to, to distribute those dividends. And that means that 
although you know investors will do quite well in the short term as a result of that in the long term they they will lose as much as anybody else does a better managed more productive higher investing firms will always do better over the long term than ones which distribute too much of their profits to to investors in the form of dividends and i think the pressure is there and it's quite difficult to change that culture i think and and uh, you know w often you get people who are you know sort of moved into companies determined to change things and in the end you know it's it's like any other job if you can't do it very quickly if you can't change the culture and get on with changing the culture very quickly i think it's very difficult to change it at all so uh, so and I, I think there is always as i say the pressure of the day to day the pressure from investors and you know the and this has been a uk problem for a very long time you know this this doesn't go back 10 years it goes back perhaps 150 years you know this is this this is tradition and culture and the uh, the bias against um expertise in certain areas and i think there's a bias against management expertise it's almost as though people who have been properly trained as managers are are showing off you know it's 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 you know you, you don't need to do you know it's 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 a strange attitude we have you know the the gentleman amateur culture is still yes. quite quite uh, quite powerful in the uk yeah it's i um I agree with you as somebody that is, uh, I'm American and British and I've worked in uh, America and Germany um, and here. And I do, I do kind of agree with you. I think that um, there isn't the respect for management as a profession um, or even perhaps the pride in being a manager that you might find in, uh, for example, the US um, or, or, or indeed um, Germany. But um, there can, of course, be uh, consequences of that. In fact, um, we've had a week full of them, it seems, um, where perhaps the lack of management training or the um, valuing of competence over behaviors has exposed some pretty shocking revelations, such as the CBI and indeed um, even amongst government ministers. Um, do you think that toxic workplaces impact economic productivity and What's what's your view of those occurrences that we've had this week? I, I certainly think they do. I mean, just go, just before I answer that, I mean, mm -hmm. one, one interesting aspect of this is that you know we we if you think about the um, the public sector as well as the uh, the private mm -hmm. sector, you know, one of the things you come across and it's really infuriating very often is if only the uh, if only the NHS got rid of all those managers. It would mm -hmm. be it would be much more successful, you know. Let the let the let the doctors and nurses run it essentially. We we know, and anybody should know, that would not work for a moment. And it's all it's almost as though you know management is is a wasted resource within within that big public sector organisation. They say it's it's infuriating. But on your point, the um you know the the resignation of Dominic Raab and the huge problems at the CBI and. Um, I was talking to some people the other the other evening, uh, many of them veterans of the CBI, and uh, we were uh, united in being in the extent to which we were aghast at these re at these revelations because the CBI has always been you know thought of as the most staid of organisations, the most uh, you know th this this is. Um, this is as, as unlikely as your, you know, discovering the Aunt Agatha was was a, a, you know, a secret heroin addict or something like that. It's just, it's just not, uh, it's not something that you would have expected. If you know, if you were, if you're naming organisations that were, um, you know, were 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 likely to fall into this this trap, it certainly wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be the CBI. But, and I think this is very serious for them. It's the the workplace culture thing. Um, it people should never have to. Um, have to go into work where they are um, where they're made to feel uncomfortable by you know cabinet ministers bullying them or by sexual harassment and all those things and there is evidence and and you, you know it wouldn't be the case that businesses try and make their workplaces more uh, more amenable to people you know so modern companies well run companies have charity days they they do various things they try and they they're very concerned with the mental health of their of their employees, because not, not just because this is a, a nice thing to do, but because they know that is reflected, in, you know, improved loyalty. You know, because the, the you know one of the biggest wastes of waste of resources for organisations is having to train people or retrain people because you've lost 
you've lost Joe in the corner, who was always very good at what he did, but wasn't very happy. You, you know, um, having to retrain, having to bring somebody in, it, it costs a lot. And so productivity is related to, to workplace culture. As for the CBI, I, you know, the CBI is, um, is I think, in a lot, of, uh, a lot of trouble now. It's, it's a relic of a past that we once had, which was when you had what we, we, know, what we used to call the three sides of industry, uh, the trade unions, the government, and business. And in those days, the, um, uh, I think the CBI was known as the, the FBI, the Federation of British Industry. They, they changed it to Confederation because I think FBI had other connotations. But, uh, um, but they, you know, the three sides of industry used to meet at something called the National Economic Development Council. There was a role for them as, as business representatives. But for many years now, the you know the CBI has even before these scandals, the CBI's um, existence was perhaps questionable because there are so many different uh, conflicts within the membership. You know, the, the the banking members don't necessarily see eye to eye with the retailing members or the manufacturing members, and so on. Other organisations, other trade bodies, do the job of representing those different sectors pretty well. I think you still need somebody to for government ministers to sit down with and maybe a new kind of organization will emerge out of the ashes of this uh, this crisis for the CBI but it doesn't look good for them I, I think it looks pretty terminal for the CBI I, I, I find it quite difficult to see how they can survive this both financially mm -hmm. you lose your members and suddenly you can't pay the salaries uh, and in terms of you know for for years to come uh, if the CBI still exists, it will be associated with this scandal. And you know, you, you getting rid of that, you know, the the uh, the mud mud of this kind justifiably sticks. And I think it would it will stick to the CBIs, and it will stick to people, you know, to anybody who is a member of the CBI. So I think it then becomes very difficult for it to survive. Well, yeah, that's um that's a very clear view. I mean, do you think um um that uh, there will be, as there was in the in the finance industry, a kind of merging of business groups into a mega group. I know that's been mooted by some. Um, do you think that might happen? It, it could be. I mean, it, it's always been the case that um, you know that different um, different business groups have have had slightly different roles. So the um, and and there there was, and I don't know if you remember this. There was. Um, there was great competition, particularly in the uh, in the eighties, uh, between the Institute of Directors and the CBI. And the Institute of Directors always saw itself as the, um, you know, the the carriers of the uh, of the Thatcherite flag. You know, they were the, they were the entrepreneurs, they were the individual businesses. CBI was larger corporation. I know they say they represent one hundred and ninety businesses. And then you've got the Chambers of Commerce, and the, the Chambers of Commerce network is essentially. A series of local chambers of commerce in pretty much every town in the country. So that's again a different organisation. I think it. Um, I think there will be. Uh, there, there has to be someone that um, the chancellor or the uh, business secretary can pick up the phone to and talk about. You know, what does business think about this? And so I think that will that will emerge. And whether it is a um, a, a kind of conglomeration of those of the different organizations we've got at the moment or something entirely new i don't know but um as i say this is this has happened so quickly i mean we you know we nobody expected this um and um so where it settles is um is quite hard to see but i think it will settle in a different place than we that we've had for as yeah. long as i can remember yeah well, I, 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 you know, you may well be right, and the jury is 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 certainly out. Um, I mean, one of the things that you mentioned, um, you know, is the attitude of investors reinforcing the attitude of perhaps the accountancy bias, um, and London, of course, so dominant in the UK, and of course, all the investors are there, and many, many of the um, um, the big companies' headquarters, you know, the FTSE companies are headquartered in London. Um, do you think that that confluence of you know the the investor side and the 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 FTSE side in London is a driver of that big regional productivity gap? The fact that we just don't, as other countries, perhaps the U.S. or Germany, have more regionally dispersed business and political centers. Yeah, I think it is, and I, I, there are t I think there are two reasons for the. Um, 
for the project to be gap between the um, between London and the southeast and the rest of the country. And the first one, of course, is that London has a bigger concentration of high value added uh, industries, particularly financial services. I mean, financial services productivity actually has been has been pretty meager since the financial crisis. And they they would say that they, you know, a lot of the things they did has been have been regulated away from them and they can't do them anymore. But still, financial services advertising professional business and professional services you know these are high value added uh, operations which tend to be concentrated in london um but the the regional picture is interesting because the you know many years ago i did a book called uh, north and south and at that time there was a a source called the um, the times 1000 which gave you the details of the thousand biggest companies in britain and um, as well as the details it gave you where the head office was located and at that time, in the well, I, I had volumes of that going back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, and when I wrote the book, the 80s. And what you saw over that period was a, you know, a, a gradual decline in the number of businesses which which had head offices in Leeds, Liverpool, Birmingham, um, Glasgow, any anywhere else, and the the you know the the gradual um, move towards. A, a real London bias in terms of where where head offices are located. He, you know, companies wanted to have their and, that, and you know in the 1990s and 2000s that that shift turned into a flood. Companies wanted their head offices near to the seat of government, near to the uh, financial centre, and the financial centre also became more concentrated in London because although Edinburgh is an important financial centre, there was a time, uh, as you will will know, when many regional cities had their own stock exchanges mm -hmm. uh, i remember many years ago going to the northern stock exchange conference um which was which was in liverpool which which again had its own stock exchange as is many other cities in in the midlands and and the north and those have all gone now you know Edin edinburgh still exists as a financial center but but most of the uh, the concentration of financial services in london the concentration of government concentration of government departments means that that's where businesses want to be and i think that is also responsible for the um for the pro you know part of the productivity uh, issue that you've described and it is extraordinary the differences in the uk are as you say much bigger than anywhere else you know the if um if every region could somehow be be pulled up even to you know within 10 percent of london's productivity we would be we'd have the best productivity in the world you know if uh, but uh, but that is uh, that's never going to happen you know so uh, yeah. and um, and 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 you also see within this the kind of um, you know the the sort of weakness of regional policy regional policy is, has always had two elements in the uk either you um, you brought workers to the work or you took work to the workers so and um, often that taking work to the workers was Giving, providing incentives for um, for businesses to set up in in the in the in the most depressed regions or shifting government bits of government departments there, but those have always been the most vulnerable in any downturn. So so it almost compounds the problem. What you need in um, in the regions is many more individual businesses than we've got. Mm -hmm. You know the the difference between the number of businesses per 10,000 population in London compared with the Northeast, compared with Scotland, compared with most of those other regions. It's just, it's an incredible difference. Twice as many businesses per 10,000 population in London as there are in, in most other regions. So, so and again, that, wow. that is a real problem. You know, not enough entrepreneurship, not enough business formation, not enough good management to, you know, to bring, bring good ideas into those regions and, and to bring prosperity. Yeah, no, it's, that's incredible. And of course, London has by far the biggest population. Um, now, I've got a couple of more questions and I've got, I know that um, our time is short, but I've got to ask, you said this earlier and you're, you know, absolutely right. Um, Well-managed employees are happier, healthier, more productive and deliver better business results, which in turn drives productivity. So why do you think, despite the obvious common sense of that, Whenever government or many other people are talking about boosting productivity, it doesn't even come into the conversation. <laughs> I think it. I, I think again, it's this. Uh, you know, it's this um, uh, bias against things that uh, that people might regard as kind of 
unnecessary or, or less right. necessary or or even I hate to say it because I don't like to use the word even woke you know the idea that you should you know <laughs> you should, you should uh, look after your people better I mean you know the the minute the uh, the civil service spends any money on away days on getting people in to talk about different things is the minute the Daily Mail gives them a, a good hiding on its front page you know so I, so I think there is a, there is you know there's a bias against doing things which which improve the quality of work, improve the quality of life for workers, and th and thus improve the improve their productivity. So, and it doesn't get much of a mention because I think people are almost uh, almost embarrassed to to talk about it, you know. And I, I think I think it is very wrong. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, well, obviously, we could not agree with you more. Of the eight million managers, we reckon eighty percent are accidental managers. They've never had any management training. Um, now, I've got to ask you uh, just a couple of more things. AI chat gpt um you know really really um picking up the pace in terms of the launches and the various uses is that going to help productivity do you think or and growth or um do you what's your view yeah i i i can't make up my mind whether this whether you know this will be this will be the game changer that we've been looking for or whether we will will look back on this and think and wonder what the excitement was all about and and uh you know, I come across many people, particularly in business and professional services, who are now using AI and using Chat GPT extensively, um, and they're using it, you know, within law firms and accountancy firms to do quite a lot of the grunt work that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, probably relatively highly paid graduates would have done done uh, uh, before this came along. But what we don't know is what what you know what those graduates are doing with the time that is then released you know are they uh, are they just leaving chat gpt to get on with it and then uh, and then actually no more productive or are they being used productively to move on to more productive tasks so i think that is the issue there so it could be a game changer but i, I always go back to this quote from a famous uh, american economist robert solo in the late 80s and his he you know the quote was you see computers everywhere except in the in the productivity statistics and i i think so <laughs> You know, there's lots of things that have come along in recent years, like, uh, you know, the widespread availability of um, of um, PCs, personal computers, the amount of computing capacity we've got in our, in our smartphones, the ability to access information really quickly on the Internet. You know, there's, there's no for people like me, there's no more ringing down to the library, uh, the Sunday Times library and saying, can you send me the cuttings on so and so I can have them within a second but um have they have all those things made any difference to productivity it's difficult to say so so it, it could be that uh, you know i really can't make up my mind on this it could it, that could be the case with ai that in the end it doesn't do as much as we hope it would do and it, maybe you need you know the, the things that will raise productivity are more physical things like you know self-driving trucks and all those things that you know which which could make which could make a difference but but the, i think the jury is out on that at the moment Okay, last question, David. Fascinating conversation. I could carry on because um, um, uh, many of the things that you've mentioned are things that uh, uh, actually we've seen at CMI and I personally uh, agree with. But what are the three most important things in your view, or maybe even the one most important thing that government needs to do to help the UK economy to grow and be more productive? And what's the one or two things you'd like to see businesses do? Yeah, the I'll, I'll slightly cheat on this because the, in terms of productivity and economic performance, I think there are, as I would say, there are three things beginning with I and one thing, thing beginning with S. And the three I's are investment. So we need more business investment that needs to be encouraged rather than perhaps discouraged through higher taxation, as we're seeing at the moment. We need more uh, infra, better infrastructure. And you see that, you know, the debates over UK infrastructure go on and on. And we and at, the, at the moment, this government is spending is going to spend less than was previously planned on infrastructure, so that's going in the wrong direction. And innovation, you know, the UK has been has always been great at inventing, pretty terrible at innovating and putting those inventions into 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 practice and into use. So so we need those three eyes to be encouraged as much as possible. And the other one, which we've talked about, is the S, which is skills, training, mm -hmm. and so on. So those are the things to to hone in on. It's not about picking winners; it's about the basics of getting better economic performance, better productivity. And if we can do that, you know, I'll come back to the famous quote by um, Paul Krugman, the American economist, that, 
you know, productivity isn't everything, but in the, in the long run, it's almost everything. If you don't have productivity, you don't have prosperity, you don't have successful businesses, you don't, you don't have a competitive economy. So those are the things we need to focus on. Well, uh, thank you, David, for sharing those thoughts with us. Um, very insightful and very provocative. We agree with you on uh, many of the, of the counts that you said, especially about the role of skills and indeed uh, the role of management and leadership. David, thank you again for joining us and for our listeners. Thank you for joining us. And I'll look forward to uh, your joining the next session of The Leading Issue. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.